The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Hayes. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. Our topic today on this Monday Faith and Bible Study, The Battle of Prayer, Part 5, Persevering in Love, is where we are going today. And if you've been persevering with us through this five-part series over the, the past Mondays, I want to thank you for for sticking with us on this battle of prayer. If you want to share any good fruits that have come from any of this, feel free to do so. Shoot me an email, jimh at thestationofthecross.com. But whether you've heard any of the other parts or not, this part stands alone. And I think the, the goodness and the truth and the beauty that the Lord has for us today, we're breaking into the Catechism of the Catholic Church under the heading, The Battle of Prayer, And under this point, this final point that we are getting into today, persevering in love. So let's start here uh, with this question. This this question sort of uh, helps us to to get real about some things real quick. And that question is, do we really want to be in a battle? We call this the battle of prayer. The catechism uses that language, the battle of prayer, because our life of prayer with our Lord Jesus is opposed to, it is not easy, but do we really want that? Do we really want to be in a battle? And I think if we're being real, if we're being uh, perfectly honest about it, nobody really wants that, right? Nobody really wants to be in a battle over prayer. We want it to be easy. We, we, want, we all want the easy button. I don't know if you, re- you remember those, uh, those advertisements. I think they used to be for staples. They had that easy button. You hit the button, everything becomes easy. And that really, I think, is what we desire, at least on the surface of our hearts and minds and lives, we want that easy way, that easy button. We want low cost and high reward or no cost and high reward. We want the high reward. We just don't want to pay much of a price to get there. At least that's how we feel from moment to moment most times. And a lot of that comes out of our own uh, disordered desires and inclinations that even after baptism, remain disordered called concupiscence, this inclination to do the wrong thing, this feeling that is inclined towards doing the wrong thing, even though that may not be what we want to do at all truly. Uh, we have sort of this, this sensible uh, feeling, this desire, this inclination to go the, the easy way, uh, even the wrong way. And so we've got to see this. We've got to contend with this and just be honest at, at a basic level of reality here. We don't really want to be in this battle over prayer. We want it to be easy. We want the low cost or no cost and high reward. So we've got to deal with this because this is not the way it works, right? There, there is no easy button for the high reward. There is no low cost, no cost, high reward in the spiritual life. Yes, God pours it out for us. Jesus is pouring out his grace for us, but at, at, at a tremendous cost to him, right? We just look at the cross and see that. And so we are given this free gift Um, However, there is a cost to saying yes, right? There is a discipleship and there is a cost to discipleship that we're going to get to. And this this isn't the way it works, this easy button way. This isn't the way it works in, in any other way either. So it would make sense that it doesn't work this way in the spiritual life. We can think about our own physical health, the physical health of our bodies, right? Diet and exercise, play a role, right? A big role there. And uh, if, our, if we're lazy in that regard, if we take the easy way at every meal and just eat whatever we feel like, even if we might feel like eating in ways that would be rather unhealthy for us, that's going to have some consequences. If we don't feel like going and doing any exercise or moving around much or being very active with our bodies, that's going to have a consequence. And so too, the other way, if we put the work in, right? If we, if we go forward and really try to develop the virtue of a good, healthy diet, even though we don't really feel like going that direction, but we do it anyway because we know it is good and we want the reward of it, and we go about it and we do that, um, then there are good consequences, but it takes work. It, it, it takes work. It takes difficulty. It takes overcoming many challenges to get there. Same too with exercise, obviously. So we can see it clearly in the physical sense, uh, we ought to be able to see it also in the spiritual 
sense. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy for us to, to do it once we see it, but I think that's the first step is to make sure that we are seeing this clearly with our spiritual health. It's also diet and exercise in a sense, right? What are we consuming, right? What are we, what are, what are we actively engaging in spiritually at the, at the deeper level of our interior lives? Are we consuming uh, bad shows and music that are giving us the wrong idea about what life is and um, tending us towards what is not good, what is not of the Lord? Or are we filling ourselves with good things, good content, the lives of the saints, sacred scripture? Are we diving into a life of prayer, being active in exercising our freedom in that way? Um, but really, it all comes down to a relationship with Almighty God. Do we want this? Do we want this relationship with Almighty God? Three divine persons in one God. One of those divine persons is, is not just fully divine, but also fully human as well. And that's Jesus who has come to us and, and has taken on flesh and has lived for us to rescue us, to lead us to the Father, to, to offer us a life in the Holy Spirit. If only we will say yes to his offer to come follow him and be willing to give Give everything for that. The, he is the pearl of great price. Jesus and his Catholic Church are the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field worth giving everything for, but it's not the easy button. We don't just hit the easy button. It, there is a cost. There are conditions of discipleship or a cost of discipleship. We can go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26 here. Let's just do 23, 24 right now. Uh, Jesus says this. He said to all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So we're getting this sense here. There is a cost to, to following Jesus. There's some stuff we're going to have to do even when we don't feel like doing it, right? We must deny ourselves in a way and take up that cross daily and come and follow Jesus. It's a daily choice. It's really a moment by moment choice. And this is true when it comes to our prayer lives. We aren't going to always be feeling like praying, um, but we ought to desire to pray. And the deepest part of who we are, we are made for this relationship with Almighty God. So we would want to have our hearts and minds turned to Him and the things of Him to set up these important times throughout the day, at least morning and evening as these pillars, and then um, be striving to live this life that he offers us with our prayer life at the core. And there is a reward to this. It's a very, very good reward, but there's also a punishment if we don't do it. And, and we have to understand that when we come into existence, when, when we come um, into our, our mother's wombs from the very moment of our, um, our own conception, our, our own, uh, the moment of fertilization of conception there, our very first moments, we come into existence under the punishment, un under the curse that, that comes forth from the original sin of our first parents. We, we contract that original sin. This is the default, that we come under this curse of punishment. This is why baptism is so essential, why Jesus coming for us and offering us this way of life in him, and then saying, go forth and baptize others, teach them all that I have commanded you. Uh, this is very, very important to understand. So we come into existence under the punishment. That's the default. And then he, set, he lays it all out. He, he lays out his life for us, rises from the dead for us, uh, pours out his Holy Spirit on his church, be, begins forth the, 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 uh, the, the inauguration of his church down through the ages all the way to us, 2,000 years. We can see it in the lives of the holy saints, those that are really fully alive in him uh, in such an amazing way that are living the sacramental life, living the, these lives of prayer to what we are called to as well. And we can see that there is a reward to saying yes to Jesus. So, we come under with that default. We come into existence within, under that default punishment that we have carried in by contracting that original sin of our parents. But then Jesus offers us a way if we say yes, if we are willing to give everything to Him and say, "I want to go Your way." It is a free cost in the sense that we don't have to pay for it with money or anything like that. But it does mean that it's going to cost us something in terms of saying, "I'm going to go this way." and not that way. I'm going to follow Jesus, not the way of the world. And that is a very real and concrete decision 
that, um, that has massive ramifications in the way we think, in the way that we act, um, and in the life of prayer, whether we're actually praying or not, and persevering in that life of prayer. And Jesus says here, to just finish this up, verses 25 through 26, he says, what profit is there for one to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit himself? That puts it in perspective, right? What if we go the way of the world and we become top dog in the world, but then we lose ourselves in the process, which we would do. We're not made for being top dog in the world without Jesus. We're made to follow Jesus wherever he leads no matter if he leads us to be uh, nothing in the eyes of the world. And that is of infinitely greater worth to be following Jesus wherever he leads, even if we're nothing in the eyes of the world, than to not follow Jesus, go the way of the world, become top dog in the world. That means nothing. That, that is worth less, right? And Jesus finishes up here saying, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father, and of the holy angels. Let us not be ashamed of Jesus and of his words. Let us say, Jesus, we will pay any cross, we will pay any cost, and we will bear any cross. By your grace, we're weak, we need you, right? But but we know you will help us. So we say, yes, we want to go your way. We want to follow you. Help us to do that. And, and over the course of this show, we're going deeper there. How can we follow him more closely in lives of, of real prayer? How do we enter into it and advance in this life of prayer that we are called to persevering in love? We'll be right back on The Simple Truth. Stay tuned. Prayer of Deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg thee through the intercession and help of the archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. I might have gone to church, you know, at Christmas time, gradually quit going. It's not as scary as I thought it was. <laughs> it's a much more warm and open place, and God really is about love. It's not about the rules and the things that I remember as a young child. It really is about the love that God has for each one of us that's so um, deep and wonderful. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org. Podcasts of our network-produced shows are free for your listening pleasure at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. Be uplifted in your faith and inspired to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on our iCatholic Radio mobile app. To the Simple Truth, Jim Havens here. We are talking about the battle of prayer today, part five of a five-part series, wrapping it up today in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There is this heading, the battle of prayer. We're looking at the, the last point of that today, persevering in love. We're going to dive into that explicitly, what it says there in the Catechism, and break that open in just a moment, but taking a little bit of time to set this up with some scripture today. We, we looked at Jesus in the last segment saying, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, Luke 9, 23. There's a cost to this every day. There is a battle to this, to following him and choosing him and not the way of the world, not the way of our flesh, of our feelings in a way that would be opposed 
to, to Jesus and to where he's calling us to. And specifically in the, in the lives of prayer that we're called to, we may not feel like praying every day. We must anyway. We must do battle against anything that is opposing our prayer lives. And we must enter into those prayer lives anyway out of love and persevering in that love, which is where we're going. But here, just a little bit more encouragement on this. Jesus wants to encourage us in this. He lays it out starkly, right? Come follow me. Pick up your cross each, each day. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but, it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He, he's talking about the, the high reward here and talking also about the high punishment, the high cost of not following him. Right? What, what is it worth to gain the whole world and, and then lose or forfeit yourself? And then in, in the end, right, if you are ashamed of me and my words, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of, he, he will be ashamed when he comes in his glory. He will be ashamed of you when he comes in his glory and in the glory of his Father and, and of the holy angels. Do, do you want to hear those words depart from me? Or do you want to hear those words come, my good and faithful servant? Right? So we have to be those good and faithful servants out of love, receiving his love, loving him back. And Jesus wants to encourage us here after laying it out starkly. Shortly following this, we've got Jesus uh, sharing a, a very big moment with us here in the transfiguration. Right, Luke 9, 29, while he was praying, his face changed in appearance and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions had been overcome by sleep, but becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. Becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. This is Uh, Peter, James, and John. And what does Peter want to do at this encouraging moment? He wants to throw up some tents and he wants to camp out. Let's stay here. This is what he says. As they were about to part part, part from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud came and cast a shadow over them, and they became frightened when they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They fell silent and did not at that time tell anyone what they had seen. Wow, so there's this huge affirmation. This is Jesus. This is the chosen son. Right? Uh, the only begotten Son of God the Father. This is, this is Jesus. We know this all now fleshed out over the, the history of the church by the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Holy Trinity. We ought to be even more sure of it than they who saw him transfigured there are sure of it because now we have a, a whole host of witnesses down through the ages who have seen this glory in some sense, maybe not exactly like the transfiguration, but in just as real a sense, they have come to know the glory of the Son, the glory of Jesus. They have become awakened, uh, fully awake, as it says in verse 32, becoming fully awake, they saw his glory, right? We have far more witnesses now. And um, And so what is this worth to us to share life with Jesus? Do we see him, first of all? the second person of the Holy Trinity who has come for us. Do we see him? Do we acknowledge him? Right? Do we say, yes, I believe in who you are. Now, what is it worth for each of us to share a life with him? Why wouldn't we want to? Right? Why wouldn't we want to? Because it's too hard? It's too hard? Well, it's far easier than the alternative, doing life on our own without him, Right? It, certainly, if we, if we kind of look down the road and, and sort of extrapolate out those two um, sort of different sorts of roads, we're going to see that, yeah, one might seem like it's harder at first following Jesus, but in the end, it's going to be way easier than the one that is going the way of the world. And in, in the end, that's going to lead to some really bad places. And all throughout, it's going to be not good, right? Not as good as the way of following Jesus, but. Um, we don't see this sometimes, right? Because we are, we want the instant gratification in the moment. So it's hard to see this in the moment. We have to keep ourselves reminded of this truth because we feel like we just want that easy thing in the moment of doing what we feel like. 
right? But there are obstacles to be faced. This is what we have to see. We want to follow Jesus. Let's commit ourselves to following Jesus. And then let's be clear and let's remember there are obstacles to be faced. There's a cross to be carried each day. There are challenges to be overcome every day. We need to expect that and anticipate that. Not be surprised or disappointed as much each day as trials and difficulties come. And so first and foremost, we have necessary tasks that are specific to our vocations that, that need to be accomplished by us each day, right? And secondarily, we, we have a calling to do some apostolic work, right? So what are you called to in terms of your vocation, the tasks that you have to, to fulfill your vocation each day? What are you called to in terms of your apostolic work, building the kingdom of God, which by the way, fulfilling our vocation is an ap- is apostolic work. We are building up the kingdom in that way as, uh, as husbands and fathers, wives and mothers, as children, in families, as priests of parishes, as bishops, all of these things, as religious, right? There is uh, a building up of the kingdom of God by being faithful to those tasks of our vocation. And yet there may be other apostolic tasks on top of that that we are called to um, going out doing pro-life work, right? Going out and and serving people that are in need uh, of of service, right? Helping to lead people to see that Jesus is real, helping to, to lead people into the kingdom of God, help them to, to get to confession, help them to understand. So all, there's, there's a lot to be done, obviously, in building up the kingdom of God all around us. What are we called to, right? The tasks of our vocation, the tasks of our apostolic work we are called to. But all of these tasks, all of these tasks that we are called to, uh, and to pick up our cross and to, and to get these things fulfilled each day by God's grace, these all begin and flow from our universal vocation, our universal call of holiness. Each one of us is called to this universal vocation of holiness, and at the heart of that is the battle of prayer. So everything depends on a life of Christian prayer. We must engage prayer as the battle it truly is in this life and strive to win the battle each day and advance. If we don't wake up thinking about this, then we better start. Right? We're, there is a battle of prayer to be won each day. Let us strive to win that battle each day and to advance in this life of prayer that we are called to. It requires effort, real participation with God's grace. And here's the secret to victory. Remembering it, remembering we are in a battle, and remembering our motivation to keep going. Authentic love which is sacrificial, to give oneself in answering the call regardless of the cost, to be willing to pay the price, to be willing to set something else aside in order to fulfill the commitments of our vocation, to fulfill the commitments of our apostolic work, to fulfill the commitments of our prayer life at the very core of all of that. So there is no easy button. It's going to be challenging, especially in the beginning stages when we're beginning in this way, because our virtues are weak, right? Our habits, our good habits are weak. We must take up our cross each day. There is no way around it for a disciple of Christ. Our victory is through the cross, not around it. We can't go around it. We've got to go through it. We've got to carry it each day. These tasks that we are called to, this life of prayer we are called to, even when it hurts, we must say yes and go forward because it is love, though, that will make it easy or at least easier, right? So I hope this is what we're going to see as we unpack this section today on persevering in love under the battle of prayer. These are some themes to to keep in mind, to take to heart as we go. But um, a little examination here first to, to think about why do you pray at all, right? Why are you doing it? Why enter into it? Why persevere in a life of prayer? Why run the the race? The answer is authentic Love, God's love for us, we receive it and we give ourselves back in love. If that's not the reason, then we need to examine what is what are we putting in its place. So quick examination here. Are your prayer times something that you think of that you just need to finish so you can get back to doing the things that you really want to do with your day, right? Let me just get this prayer done and then I can go back to what I really want to do. Or are your daily prayer times something that you cherish, something that you look forward to, high points of your day, even when you're in a, in a state of desolation, that there's still something um, more deeply consoling, even though it's not a, a sensible consolation, more deeply consoling in the soul because you know that you are with him in a way that is 
um, really taking it seriously, this relationship, really giving him your full attention, really being open to receive whatever it is he wants to give you in this time, really giving yourself in this time of prayer, right? These prayer times that we set up, these pillars of prayer throughout the day, right? Do we cherish them, something that we look forward to, high points of our day or not? Is Jesus someone that you cherish, someone that you look forward to spending more time with each day? Right? We want to make sure that this is not, that we're not seeing our prayer lives as let's just get it done and get back to life, right? We want to see it as let's enter in so that we can be with him always, right? Not just in that moment and then turn back to something else, but in that moment, right? So we can stay with him no matter what else we're doing. So it's not finish your prayer time and then you're done praying. It's reignite your relationship with your prayer time and then abide in him, throughout all the times in between. It's not about easing our conscience and just saying, well, I'm trying to be good and and do my prayer and now I've checked the box, right? It's about living a life of love in Jesus, participating in that eternal exchange of love that is the very nature of Almighty God himself, even when it doesn't feel sensibly good, when we don't have those, those, those consoling, sensible feelings in prayer, which we will have sometimes and are a great gift, Um, But we ought not need them to be able to commit to showing up to prayer and to persevering in the love of him that we are revealing by showing up for prayer day in and day out and then striving to um, make a prayer of all that we do throughout the day in between those times of more intense prayer where we're really giving him our full attention, striving to give him our full attention. Um, So is this difficult to hear? Right? This might be difficult to hear, and, and I would just ask, why would that be? Um, but, but think about it. Do you receive this message with joy, or do you go away sad from hearing this message, message like, oh, my whole life has to be prayer in some sense? Like, oh, I, I don't want it to be that much prayer. Does it make you sad to think of um, increasing prayer, to be, to, to be generous in your love of God in your prayer life? Right? Just remember this. No matter how you feel right now about this truth that we are made for this life of prayer with the Lord, this is a gift for you. Whether or not you understand that right now or not, know it. This is the greatest gift. You don't need to get everything, but just see the vision. He wants to share his life and mission with you. He wants to share his life and mission with you. He loves you with everything. And this is the greatest gift that he can share his life with you and that you can receive it and give your life back to him. See the next step wherever you're at and take it. Hopefully you're going to see that over the length of the second half of this show. We will be right back on The Simple Truth. Stay tuned. weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Mother Miriam Live. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun on a mission to bring Jesus and a message of hope to a world that has lost its way. Hello, beloved. This is Mother Miriam, and I am thrilled to welcome you to Mother Miriam Live. As always, you're going to be able to call, text, or email whatever your questions are. Through a partnership between the Station of the Cross and LifeSite News, you will be able to listen and Watch Mother Miriam live on YouTube and Facebook at the Station of the Cross, including past episodes on podcast. God bless you. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate and our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Or watch the Mother Miriam live video stream on Facebook and YouTube by searching the Station of the Cross. That's Mother Miriam live each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. Love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24-7. 
24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here talking about the battle of prayer today, part five of a five-part series. We are going right now into the Catechism of the Catholic Church under this heading, the battle of prayer, and the fourth point, persevering in love. In previous episodes, we've gone through the first three points, objections to prayer, humble vigilance of heart, filial trust, and now persevering in love. I believe it's the shortest of the four sections and so that's why we could go with a little bit of a, a more of a lengthy setup today, which I hope was helpful. But if not, you're, you're coming in here right at the right point. So persevering in love under the battle of prayer, Catechism of the Catholic Church 2742 says this, pray constantly, always, and for everything giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. This is 1 Thessalonians 517 and Ephesians 520, to which St. Paul adds, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. This is in Ephesians 6, 18. And it goes on to say here in the catechism, for we have not been commanded to work, to keep watch and to fast constantly, but it has been laid down that we are to pray without ceasing. All right, so it, it goes on to say this, then this tireless fervor can only come from love. Against our dullness and our laziness, the battle of prayer is that of humble, trusting, and persevering love. Hear that again. Against our dullness and laziness, the battle of prayer is that of humble, trusting, persevering love. This tireless fervor, it said, can only come from love. Think about this, right? Think about this choice. This is such a good way to express it. I find it extremely helpful. Think about the choice of prayer that often comes to us, whether it's showing up for our commitments to prayer in those pillars of prayer, those, those times of greater intensity where we're trying to, to give our full attention uh, to the Lord in these pillars of prayer, whether it's that or whether it's trying to persevere in this praying constantly, this praying without ceasing throughout the day, keeping our hearts and minds um, fundamentally turn towards our Lord and the things of God, right? It, regardless of what it is, the choice is always going to be against our dullness and laziness, um, battling that and battling for this humble, trusting, persevering love. I, I think if, if we're focused on ourselves and how we feel all the time, well, that's going to lead us more to go towards our dullness and our laziness, um, but if we are more focused on him, if we can just get our gaze on our Lord in a fundamental way where we, we just have a disposition of heart and mind that is turned to him, that's what we want. A disposition that is just constantly fundamentally turned to him, right? That, that is one of humble, trusting, persevering love. So God, we know you're pouring out the grace. Help us to participate with your grace, to receive this great gift, to grow in it more and more and more. The catechism says here that this love opens our hearts to three enlightening and life-giving facts of faith about prayer. The first fact is it is always possible to pray. The second fact, prayer is a vital necessity. And the third fact, prayer and Christian life are, in, are inseparable. Now it breaks them all open. So this first one, it is always possible to pray. This is paragraph 2743. The time of the Christian is that of the risen Christ, who is with us always, no matter what tempests, what storms may arise. Pointing here to Matthew 2820, pointing also to the Gospel of Luke 824. We're going to get into both of those in a moment. But it says here, our time is in the hands of God. It is possible, St. John Chrysostom says, it is possible to offer fervent prayer even while walking in public or strolling alone or seated in your shop while buying or selling or even while cooking. St. John Chrysostom gives us that advice. So it is possible to be praying always, even while we're doing other things, to have our hearts and minds fundamentally turned towards God, even maybe interior, interiorly invoking him or, or talking to him or uh, receiving 
um, little promptings and graces from him, whatever it may be, all of that is possible when our hearts and minds are fundamentally turned towards him. But that is a, a choice. It can become a virtue. It can become a very good habit if we choose that over and over and participate with God's grace in doing that. It can become uh, such a strong virtue where we don't even have to think about it much. And that virtue is so firm that our disposition is just fundamentally turn to him always. I think you do see this in the lives of many of the saints. They get to this point. But let's just hear these points of scripture that were uh, um, pointed to here in this paragraph. It said, uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, because what Jesus says there in verse 20, he says, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. He is always with us. The, the resurrected Lord is always with us, right? Do we act like it? Do we have that sense that he's always with us? Are we always with him? Some very important truths to ponder there, some things to think about. Luke eight twenty four says, they came and woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. He awakened, rebuked the wind and the waves and they subsided and there was a calm. That's when Jesus uh, calmed the, the storm, he was sleeping and they're panicking and help us, we're perishing, master, master. He wakes up, he rebukes the wind and the, and the waves, and then there's calm, right? So um, he has power over all things, even the storms in our lives, whether they are outside of us, whether they are inside of us, um, we can turn to him. He is with us, uh, know that he is always there, and he can bring the calm. He can bring the calm interiorly and even outside in our lives in, in many ways. There may be times where, um, where he doesn't bring the calm for whatever reason. And in those times, we must trust him, right? We, we, we are right to call upon him, but we are right to trust him regardless of the outcome of whatever he does. Um, here, he calms the storm, thanks be to God. There, there could be other times where he lets the storm go, but we are not going to perish. That's the thing. If we stick with him Ultimately, we will be with him for all eternity in heaven. We will not eternally perish, right? So we must understand that he has our good. He is good, perfectly good. He knows everything. He loves us. Let's stick with him no matter what, no matter if it seems like, oh, I'm not sure why you're not doing this or not doing that. Trust him. Have that disposition of that filial trust, that filial love of the Father in Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Come Help us to have this, Lord. Help us to have this disposition that trusts in you no matter what and calls on you so that you can bring calm when we need it and, and that we expect that you are going to show up in that one way or another, however you will. It continues on here, 2744 in the Catechism, prayer is a vital necessity. So it says, if we do not allow the Spirit to lead us, we will fall back into the slavery of sin, pointing here to Galatians 5, 16 through 25. How, and it says here, how can the Holy Spirit be our life if our heart is far from him? Nothing is equal to prayer. For what is impossible, it makes possible. What is difficult? Easy. For it is impossible, utterly impossible, for the man who prays eagerly and invokes God ceaselessly ever to sin, says St. John Chrysostom. So it does make what is difficult easier or easy, it says here. Um, but don't expect everything is going to be easy without obstacle. There's going to be the obstacles. But again, with real love, with that real commitment to receive his love and to love him back, um, we, would, we will be able to overcome anything um, with that sort of love flowing through us by God's grace. So that's where we want to be. We want to be praying eagerly, invoking God. And, and like St. John Chrysostom says, they have even hope here that if we're doing that, if we're praying eagerly, invoking God, praying um, without ceasing, that it, it is, um, it's impossible ever to sin if we're living that life where we have that disposition that is constantly turned to him and seeking him and striving to live his will in our lives. Um, there's going to be good fruits in that we will have a new freedom, right? Freedom from the slavery of sin for a life of virtue, these good habits we are called to and a life of grace, ultimately sanctifying grace is what we are made for, a life free from eternal death, death free for eternal life. Uh, but if we do not uh, allow the Spirit to lead us, we fall back into the slavery of sin. So we have to remember that. 
right? St. Saint, Saint Alphonsus Liguori puts it very clear here when he says, those who pray are certainly saved, and those who do not pray are certainly damned. This is really the dividing line. This is really the examination line. How, how is our prayer lives? How, how are we there, right? Are we praying? Are we advancing in our prayer lives? Are we advancing in our love concretely where we can look at our prayer lives and say, yeah, by God's grace, I'm, 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 I'm participating with that grace. I'm growing in this life of love, this life of prayer with the Lord, and I can see it in my actions. There is fruitfulness in, in, in my vocation, in, in the apostolic works that I'm called to, right? Or am I not showing up for my prayer times? Am I, am I not praying well or, or even much at all? Uh, this is going in the wrong direction. If you go really in the wrong direction there, those who do not pray are certainly damned. St. Alphonsus Liguori says they will be in a slavery of sin. If we're not loving our Lord, if we're not striving to be open to receive his grace and to love him back, then we're not going to have the strength that we need, his grace, to be able to keep ourselves out of that slavery of sin, to allow him to rescue us from that because we are closed off to him. We're not receiving him. We're not entering into that time with him that we need, that we are made for. So, Catechism of the Catholic Church 2745, prayer and Christian life are inseparable, for they concern the same love and the same renunciation proceeding from love. So there's a renunciation that proceeds from love. The same filial and loving conformity with the Father's plan of love. The same transforming union in the Holy Spirit who conforms us more and more to Christ Jesus. The same love for all men the love with which Jesus has loved us. So prayer and the Christian life, inseparable in all of these ways, they go together. It says here, he prays without ceasing who unites prayer to works and good works to prayer. Only in this way can we consider as realizable the principle of praying without ceasing. So it's not um, to be praying, you know, the, 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 the rosary without doing anything else, praying it 30 times a day. I think Padre Pio was saying it, praying the, the rosary like 22, 23 times a day, something like that. But he was probably doing it while he was doing other things as well, I would imagine. But then again, he had the gift of bilocation. So who knows how, how that was all working out with St. Padre Pio. But, but for us, we can't just be like on our knees there in intense prayer all day long. That's not our calling. If we're called to the vocation of family life, for instance, we have, we have tasks of our vocation we must complete, right? We've, we've got to do these things. So, so we have to be um, having that life of prayer, but we also have to be doing the works of our vocation. Um, so the only way that we can pray without ceasing is to do our, t- our prayer time throughout the day, those pillars of prayer where we give our full attention, but then also enter into those vocational tasks as well and to be able to unite our prayer to works and our good works to prayer. So it, we should never stop praying in that sense. Even when we're not in those intense times of prayer throughout the day, we need to keep praying, to pray without ceasing, uniting our prayer to works and our works to prayer. We, we got to catch that vision. So I hope you already have that vision, but if you don't catch it now, right, uniting our prayer to works and our good works to prayer. But understand, we have to have those times where we're giving him, striving to give that full attention as well, or we're never going to be able to do that, right? We've got to have those times. We can't think about it this way. In a relationship where, say, we're doing good work with somebody else, right? If we're not growing in a relationship with them where we're spending time, okay, we got to plan out what we're doing and then we're going to go do it. And then, okay, but we've got to grow in our ability to work together uh, before we're just diving into the work together. Now we're going to grow in a relationship as we're working together. That's good, but there's going to be times where we just need to kind of get to know each other some. Um, Now that analogy might fall flat with prayer in some sense, but just think about it this way, right? We've got to get to know our Lord because we've got to get to We've got to get to receive all that he has for us in who he is, which is going to change us and actually make us more like him. It's a master-disciple relationship. We've got to spend time getting to know the master. Then when we go forth to be ambassadors for the master, to to be disciples that are out there doing the good that he's calling us to do, we can do it because we know the master. And, And he's been teaching us up through our time of prayer. Now we can go forth with him and do the good work that we are called to. I hope that makes sense. All right, but, but where, when we get back, we've got to hit a big finish here. In our final segment, we're going to circle back to where we began, but we're also going to get the life of a saint in here to help make it all more concrete and well 
as well. And hopefully that's encouraging. So we'll finish strong when we get back on The Simple Truth. Stay tuned. If the cares and anxieties of life are weighing you down, come to the St. Thomas More House of Prayer and allow the Lord to refresh your soul. The St. Thomas More House of Prayer is a Catholic retreat center devoted to praying and promoting the Liturgy of the Hours. You'll find a tranquil atmosphere that's ideal for deep prayer, whether as an individual or for a group retreat. We're located at 365 Hill City Road in Cranberry, Pennsylvania. Make your reservation today or learn more at liturgyofthehours.org. You can also call us at 814-676-1910. That's 814-676-1910. We would love to help you experience the Liturgy of the Hours and discover the prayer that will change your life. The iCatholic Radio mobile app is two apps in one. Your place to hear great Catholic programs and music. Here's what listeners are saying about the updated iCatholic Radio mobile app. Through the iCatholic Radio app, I have listened to the sermons and teachings several times. The effect has been a deeper understanding of my faith and Catholic tradition. This app has truly been a blessing in my life and has increased my faith. With the new app, you can choose to listen to our programs like Mother Miriam Live or The Catholic Current whenever you like. But you can also switch over to the best in contemporary music by Catholic artists. We even bring you hours of Gregorian chant every Sunday morning. If you do not currently have our app, download it to your iPhone through the Apple Store or to your Android phone by going to Google Play and searching iCatholic Radio. The updated iCatholic Radio mobile app, your one stop for great Catholic programs and music. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here talking about the Battle of Prayer Part 5 today in a five-part series. And we just went through in the last segment the rest of the section under the Battle of Prayer, Persevering in Love. Now let's circle all the way back to the beginning and look at that in light of all that has been said, all that we have kind of soaked in here. And when we go back to the beginning here, hear this. So 2725 of the Catechism, prayer is both a gift of grace and a determined response on our part. It always presupposes effort. It is a gift of grace and a determined response. It always presupposes effort. We want to humbly receive this gift of grace, of prayer, and we want to faithfully respond by putting the effort in to set up prayer times and to show up for prayer times and to strive to have our hearts and minds turn to God all throughout our day in between those prayer times, combining our prayer with the good work that we are called to. And this ought to make it easier in a sense. There are going to be obstacles all throughout the day. We are called to pick up our cross and take these things on to do the good that we are called to, even when it hurts, to give ourselves in love. And this is the thing that motivates us, this love. Seeing the love of Jesus poured out for us upon the cross and his suffering and death upon the cross and understanding the resurrection to see that as well. And then for us, and when these times are difficult in our vocational tasks, apostolic tasks, and even in the task of turning to prayer um, and those times of prayer showing up to say yes, to do it even when it hurts, pouring ourselves out in love of him. So responding to his love, receiving his love, responding to his love, pouring ourselves out in love and knowing that the resurrection will be the fruit of all of this, right? This is going to really fulfill who we are made to be, fulfill Um, It's going to be helpful in terms of everybody that it affects in doing the good works that we are called to, and it is going to be extremely fruitful, right? But we have to see it as the challenge that it is and give ourselves in love to it, even when it's hard. goes on to say here, 2697, prayer is the life of the new heart. It ought to animate us at every moment, but we cannot pray at all times if we do not pray at specific times, consciously willing it. Special times of Christian prayer, both in intensity and duration. These are the pillars of prayer that we talk about. 
The tradition of the church proposes to the faithful certain rhythms of praying intended to nourish continual prayer. Some are daily. It speaks here of morning and evening prayer. Sacred scripture is important, right? We want we can use that in our morning and evening prayer. We could pray the liturgy of the hours, morning and evening prayer, even more if we wish. We could pray the Holy Rosary. We could pray uh, a decade in the morning, a decade in the evening, or we could pray a set of mysteries in the morning and another set of mysteries in the evening, or we could pray four sets of mysteries throughout the day and pray all 20 mysteries, or we could pray three sets of mysteries and pray 15 mysteries throughout the day, right? So th- there's lots of ways we can set up these pillars throughout our day. Those are some examples, but traditionally at least morning, uh, uh, some sort of a morning pillar of prayer and an evening pillar of prayer that we're always going to show up for. I, I do recommend um, thinking about mental prayer as well. You can go back to the interview I did with uh, Connie Rossini not long ago on mental prayer. Very helpful in that regard, praying with the sacred scriptures and all that that entails. So grace before and after meals is also helpful. The Angelus, 6, 12, and 6 are the traditional times, really soaking in that mystery of the incarnation. And the sacramental life is at the very core of this, centered on the Sunday Eucharist. That's a pillar we cannot miss. We must show up for the Sunday Eucharist. We must show up for Mass on Sunday, right? And uh, and also all the holy days of obligation. But then even more so, can we go to Mass at other days as well? Is it there for us? Can we go to Mass? Can we receive our Lord in the Eucharist in that state of grace on other days? Confession, right? At least I would say once a month, maybe more frequently. Whenever you can get there, some people go even once a week, Right, So confession is there, the medicine box to strengthen us. Certainly, if we're in mortal sin, get to confession as soon as possible. If you have a serious sin on your soul, don't waste a moment. Go find a priest, lay it out, and and be freed of it by God's grace. Um, So we have to understand, though, this is going to be a battle at every stage. There's going to be all sorts of opposition in the world, the flesh, and the devil. We have to love enough to overcome that opposition Call on God's grace to say, God, help me to break through this opposition and, and, to, and to follow through on the good that I know I am called to do. And we, can, we also have other help that is available to us. We can call upon the intercession of the saints. So I want to finish with this, knowing that uh, you know it's powerful for the church militant, those who are on earth right now in this battle, um, on the way, on this pilgrimage towards heaven, that we can ask help from the church triumphant, those who are already there. I want to mention one um, one uh, saint that I've been getting to know uh, a little bit more lately, Saint Rita of Cassia, and this is from the the National Shrine of Saint Rita of Cassia in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, SaintRitaShrine.org says this: Good Friday of 1442, 15 years before her death, she had an extraordinary experience in co- in contemplation before an image of Jesus that was very dear to her. She was moved by a deeper awareness of the physical and spiritual burden of pain, which Christ so freely and willingly embraced for love of her and of all humanity, with the tender, compassionate heart of a person fully motivated by grateful love, she spoke her willingness to relieve Christ's suffering by sharing even the smallest part of his pain. Her offer was accepted, her prayer was answered, and Rita was united with Jesus in a profound experience of spiritual intimacy, a thorn from his crown penetrating her forehead. The wound it caused remained open and visible until the day of her death. So a powerful story there about St. Rita of Cassia. She is a very powerful intercessor, um, often said to be the saint of the impossible, a saint, uh, a patroness of lost causes like St. Jude, a patron of lost causes, and uh, also a, uh, also called to be a, ca- uh, known to be a peacemaker as well. So if uh, you need that peace in your heart, right, ask, ask a little intercession from St. Rita to help you to draw closer to the Prince of Peace, Jesus, and to receive that grace of peace in your heart. And, and uh, she's very helpful in that regard, plus also uh, uh, making peace between um, where there's division in families and, and elsewhere, um, she can be a very powerful intercessor in that way. If you read her biography, uh, more about her story, you'll, you'll learn why. Uh, but here I want to lift her up in, in this respect, right? This this desire when she sees the love of Christ concretely for her in the physical and spiritual burden of pain that he so freely and willingly embraced, right? To see that example and to see that he loves her, 
right? That inspires her to love him back and say, I want to console you. What can I do for you? Right. For her, it was, uh, she's receiving this, uh, mystical, which was a very actual real thing. The crown, the thorn from the crown, uh, of thorns, a thorn, it actually came and, uh, and caused a wound on her forehead, penetrated her forehead. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing, right? For us though, what can we learn in this? That's probably not going to be the way the Lord works with us in, in, in this way. But what we can see is that same desire, first of all, to see the love of Jesus for us. And then to say, I want to love you back. And I want to console you in your sufferings for me. How can I do that? Well, we can do it by um, breaking through those times when we don't feel like showing up for our prayer or turning our hearts and minds to him or doing the tasks of our vocation that we know are good and that we must fulfill, or that apostolic work that we just don't want to do anymore, but we know we're being called to it, to say yes and to do it even at great cost to our own feelings, I guess, or or to our own um, emotions or whatever it might be, whatever it is that's trying to stop us from doing the good that we are called to do, to break through for love of Jesus, right? To console him in his love for us and the suffering and cost of his love for us, to, to, to give a little bit more for him, to let that love motivate us and drive us to break through the obstacle. I want to finish here with the Gospel of John 21, 15 through 19. Maybe there's something in this for you as we close. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Well, this goes on three times, right? Lord, you know everything you know that I love you. This is what Jesus says. Amen, amen, I say to you. When you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And he closes by saying, follow me. Let us follow Jesus. Let us lead, let us let him lead us even where we do not want to go, knowing it is what is best for us. Let him lead us into a deeper life of prayer, even if it hurts because we don't get to do some of the other things we like to do. Let us dive into loving him, receiving his love and loving him back. Let us win the battle of prayer by his grace and by his love. God bless you.